Awesome. So yeah, let's move to the next speaker. And um, the next speaker is no other person than Brandon. Brendan O'Leary. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. So Brendan is, uh, is a senior developer evangelist at GitLab, and he will be talking on the topic predictions in the cloud native ecosystem. Um, yeah, uh, Brendan, uh, take it away. Yeah, how's it going? Thank you. you did perfect on the name. So thank you. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Thanks yeah. so much for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be here, um, and yeah, I'll um I'm just uh, gonna share my screen. Hopefully, um, hopefully I can just do this window. Ba -ba -bum. Great, awesome. Okay, hopefully you're seeing my slides now. All right. Well, thanks again so much uh, for having me. I'm really really excited to be here. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to get to talk to you all today. I'm excited that, uh, our Kubernetes community day, uh, community days program is coming back to life, um, after, you know, uh, quite the hiatus, um, given, given everything we've been going through, uh, as a world in, in this pandemic, um, I'm excited that the first, uh, community day back, uh, is in Africa. Um, I like the previous speaker. I wish I could be there with you. Um, I'd love to come visit. I've only ever been uh, to Africa once. Me and my team got to go to Cape Town, so kind of all the way in the south. Um, I flew over the whole continent from from London on the way, but I'd love to to visit more. Um, I think everybody's kind of feeling that. <laughs> like I used to travel a good amount for work, um, and uh, I think like as the pandemic hopefully. Um, you know, ends, uh, and hopefully we, we get uh, it under control. I feel like everyone's got the travel bug to try and, and, and go and see parts of the world that we, you know, we, we took travel for granted maybe in lots of ways before. So excited for that. Uh, again, my name is, is Brendan O'Leary. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I work uh, at GitLab, actually with Abu Bakar, who's one of the organizers of the event. Um, and he asked me to come uh, speak to you today about predictions uh, in the cloud native ecosystem. So that's probably the hardest thing <laughs> to come and speak about, but I'm, I'm honored that he thought, you know, I would have something to add to that conversation. Uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully I do. <laughs> hopefully you learned something today. Um, also really interested in any questions you have for me. I'm, I'm in addition to working at GitLab, I'm actually a member of the governing board of the CNCF. Uh, I've been a member for probably just about a year at this point. Um, and so I'm really interested in questions you might have for me um, and uh, about either, you know, GitLab, of course, or the CNCF itself. Um, questions and thoughts you might have, um, thoughts about today's event. All, all of those things are wide open <laughs> um, to talk about. But um, first today, I kind of want to go through um, kind of my thoughts and, and kind of a level set of how I think we got to where we are. Uh, of course, some of this might not be news for, for folks joining um, this event who have, you know, been following the cloud native community or, or following, um, you know, Kubernetes for a long time. Um, but I want to give some context because I think that before you can try and predict the future, which of course no one can, uh, you have to have the context of, of how we got to where we are. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some specific things in the cloud native technology space uh, that I think are going to be uh, important in the coming years. Um, and, and that's reflective of kind of my view on, on watching the industry as well as, you know, what other industry leaders have been talking about uh, in cloud native, uh, including the head of the the technical oversight committee, Liz Rice. So I have to give credit to her for some of these ideas um, because she has a finger on the pulse of, of, of everything, of course. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about industry trends in, in general, like things outside of maybe cloud native, but that are either tangentially or, or related in the sense that, you know, it's in the software industry and, and trends that are happening uh, <clears throat> in enterprise software and, and software in general. 
and then and then we'll talk about well what's next like how if these are the predictions for now you know how can you possibly keep up with uh with where we're going so that's kind of what we're going to cover today all right and um so first you know how how did we get here right well you know by way of a kind of a brief intro you know really the landscape of software development is changing and it's, it's in some ways always changing, but I think that um, the advent of the cloud and the po growing popularity of it, uh, the advent of cloud native technologies have accelerated it. And I think that's that in itself isn't something that's very new. Um, again, it's always changing. If we look at like kind of what modernization in software has looked like, um, we've seen these kind of trends that come and accelerate growth in software. Uh, so, you know, 10 or 12 years ago at this point, uh, there's a famous uh, venture capitalist who said, uh, Mark Andreessen, he said that software is eating the world. Uh, and I think that that was very true then and is true now. I think software has eaten the world, right? We've seen uh, that software is the way that companies now differentiate themselves from one another. Uh, it's uh, every company is a software company, um, whether they make software, you know, as their primary product or they sell something else, um, you know, every company needs, uh, software and, and, and to be able to move quickly, uh, and adapt to change with their software, uh, in order to be competitive in whatever environment they're competing in. And so, you know, we had waterfall and agile. Those are methodologies for, for building software that came along uh, years ago. DevOps now is a, a 10 year old term. Um, and, you know, it was the idea that we want to marry development and operations in a way that we can get software out the door faster to our customers. Um, and then really we have this, you know, more recently, the, this concept of cloud native, the reason we're all together here, right? This is, I want dynamic environments. I want to be able to scale up and down with demand. Uh, I want to be able to, yes, deploy quickly and, and, and scale quickly. And, you know, this line is kind of like a, like a straight line, uh, but I would say it's almost curved, right? Cause each of these innovations not only allows us to continue to grow, um, software development as a, as an industry, but it also accelerates that speed of delivery. Uh, and so cloud native has definitely done that. And, you know, when we talk about every, company being a software company, well, then you end up with all of these companies that have, you know, stories that are then related to cloud native, right? These, these are just pictures I literally took off of uh, the Kubernetes customer stories website, uh, you know, images of um, company logos. But I think it tells a really interesting story, the different kinds of enterprises and companies that you find there who are leveraging Kubernetes for its value, but really to solve very different problems, right? You have banks, right? These large banks like Capital One, ING, you know, these, these banks are typically, you know, banks, we typically think of banks as kind of late adopters to software or, or industry trends, um, right? They move slowly, they're very particular, uh, but even in banking, right? It's been disrupted uh, in many ways by software. And so, we see those those folks uh, needing to innovate still within their bounds uh, that they have, right? Or we see, you know, um, traditional journalism like New York Times, um, right? That obviously is a world that's hugely changed uh, since the advent of the internet. And in order to kind of preserve their their business and their ability to produce uh, content and journalism, they have to be able to move faster. Uh, and then you even see IBM, right? Like the oldest uh, company when it comes to computers and and uh, uh, software or any of any kind, right? Also embracing cloud native, right? They they really embrace it as they as they purchased Red Hat, um, who has a lot of products based around Kubernetes and other cloud native technologies. Um, but they use Kubernetes themselves to uh, you know enable that fast to market software. And so those are kind of the you know large enterprises that see this as a as a competitive advantage, but then on the other side is startups right that also see this as a huge competitive advantage to be able to 
reach scale without investing the kind of money and resources that those larger enterprises would be able to. So kind of the other side of that coin is, you know, cloud native enables those companies uh, to be able to be competitive and, and scale in a way that's, that's, you know, new in a lot of ways, right? The internet did this for sure, but cloud native adds another layer on top of it where you don't need a massive capital outlay, a massive investment of money uh, in order to, you know, build a, a business that can scale to the globe. Um, we've seen that happen time and time again uh, with startups who live in the cloud. They are really the cloud native, right? They they were born in the cloud and, and live there. Uh, but we've also seen uh, academia and, and research institutions make huge strides, right? We just heard uh, about data and 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 data in cloud native right we have these universities and, and large academic um or nonprofit organizations that are leveraging cloud native to do exactly that to to level up what they're doing with data again to build scale that they wouldn't otherwise be able to uh just from a you know cost prohibitive perspective um they can do things that they were, were weren't able to even dream of uh, before the cloud and, and cloud native technology. And so those stories really show us that, you know, cloud native touches all of these different areas. Uh, and so because of that, I mean, that's, I guess, again, a lot of preaching to the choir, if you will, um, you know, you're maybe bought into that. Uh, that's why you're here. Um, so I think a natural question is, well, well, what's next, right? So we've got Kubernetes. It's been around for quite some time. Um, if all these other fantastic projects, many of which are presenting here today, um, you know, where do I focus my energy as a technologist to say, you know, these are the things that I want to understand more um, because they're up and coming. And so one of those things is, is Kubernetes at the edge. Um, and so the edge can, can mean a lot of things. Um, it can mean, you know, connected devices or internet of things or IOT devices, but it can also mean sensors and equipment for lots of different platforms that live at the edge. And the sheer volume uh, of the data created by all of these devices, right? There's something like 30 billion connected devices. I don't even know how you count that, but, but folks make an attempt to count that uh, in a market of 700 billion going to a trillion dollars uh, in the next six years uh, for these kinds of devices. So the, the volume of data and information, well, data created by, let's, let's, let's um, separate data and information. So data, just raw data created by these devices, you know, staggering amount of data. And so to turn that data into useful information, uh, you, you have to have more processing power out near them to process and send that collected data, that aggregated data, that aggregated information back into your cloud services, right? You can't just stream all of that data all the time um, necessarily. And, and so that's where the edge comes to be. And so again, I haven't really <laughs> clearly defined what the edge is, right? It could be these Internet of Things devices, but really I think the way to think about the edge is um, to define it as to what it's not, right? So you have endpoints, which are the end user devices and the other uh, data generating devices. And you have your core, which is like your core infrastructure. Maybe that's in the cloud or it's on-premise. And, and the edge lives somewhere in the middle there, right? So this is things that might be are closer to those endpoints, um, but might have computing power um, requirements before that data gets, gets sent back into the core infrastructure. And so it can mean a lot of things. And we've seen it mean a lot of things. So there's a lot of mission-critical decisions that happen to happen on that edge, right? Based on what the current data is, what the previous models we had were. Um, and these are, you know, grandiose <laughs> versions of that, right? Kubernetes in your car, um, you know, obviously that's something we could all think of. Um, but then also NASA is, you know, putting Kubernetes clusters now in devices that it's flying out into space, into the moon. Um, we receive the European Space Agency and other space agencies doing that as well. Um, and the U.S. Air Force putting it inside of a, a fighter jet. Uh, so these are places where there's a lot of data being generated uh, and a huge need for processing power there at the edge. 
but there's other simpler things, right? These are kind of the grandiose things, you know, if you think of surveillance systems or road or toll or traffic management systems, lighting, asset tracking, right? there's lots and lots of uh, things at the edge that need this kind of computing power. And that's why talking about Kubernetes at the edge and, and things like uh, K3S and, and ways of running Kubernetes in a lightweight way, but still leveraging all the benefits of it uh, is, is going to be a trend that's going to be around for a while. <coughs> and, you know, the, the, the growing uh, spread of 5G and other, you know, fast uh, broadband wireless uh, technology is going to only increase that throughput uh, and increase the amount of data that's coming through the edge. <clears throat> so second, um, another trend that I think is is still being figured out is, is called service mesh. And uh, so again, let's let's talk about that and, and kind of define it. Well, I think before you can define service mesh, you really have to understand what a microservice is. And then again, differentiating microservices from a service mesh because they're kind of interrelated. So a, a microservice, right? The idea of that is, you know, we used to build um, only these large monolith software applications that, you know, kind of is one code base that does everything, um, you know, does all of the, transaction processing, it does all of the business logic, it does all of the, you know, handling of login and, and identity and all of that in kind of one massive monolith. The idea of microservices is you break that into distinct services, right? There's an identity service, there's a payment processing service. Uh, and, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic idea for a lot of businesses because at a large enterprise, you're going to have massive teams uh, that have to then figure out, you know, who's working on what uh, and how do we, you know, distinguish changes between one another. Um, but the question quickly becomes, how will you scale it? And this is a fantastic little <laughs> fun illustration from a friend of mine on Twitter, Chloe Condon. And I have to, anytime I say talk about scale, I have to just include it just because I think it's a lot of fun. And that's really where service mesh comes in and why there's been so much discussion over the past year and will continue to be a lot of discussion about service mesh uh, in the cloud native space. And the reason for that, if I can click, is service mesh tries to create a layer where we're able to control, you know, a lot about these microservices, right? We have all these microservices. Um, if we just connect them all together <laughs> individually, you have a lot of connection points to think about and what's the right you know, level of data access between this service A and service B. Um, but using a service mesh allows you to place kind of a proxy layer where all of the metrics about traffic and routing and then how do we retry and when do we time out and how do we turn something on and off um, is, uh, is, you know, controlled within that service mesh control plane. Uh, and so that's why you see a lot of folks talking about, you know, there was a lot of uh, kerfuffle last year about which service mesh is best. Um, I won't get into all of that, but I do think service meshes is, is something that's going to be around for a while as uh, more folks adopt microservices and see that while it is a great model, it, it, it quickly can spiral out of control if you don't have a way to centrally control it, which of course you did in a monolith. So those are the kind of cloud native technologies I want to look after. Um, but I also think there's some industry trends and I honestly don't know why I drew this line. I mean, it, it's somewhat arbitrary, but I think that there's these trends really impact the whole software industry and not just the cloud native community, although that could be argued for, for either side of any of these. Um, and so there's a couple of things I want to talk about there that I think are becoming really important. The first and, and maybe the most critical is, is supply chain security. This is something that's gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, and, and I think the reason that it's now getting so much attention, I mean, supply chain attacks, right? Attacking somewhere along the supply chain. It has been around as long as humanity has been around, right? That's, if you read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, you'll, you'll read about supply chain attacks. Um, but I think they're getting software supply chain attacks are getting so much focus currently because we're at a point where 
there's a lot of organizations and enterprises who have really matured their security practices fairly well and created, you know, defensive perimeters and other areas where uh, they're, they're relatively secure. Uh, and so then attackers decide to then find the suppliers to those organizations that may be less mature security wise and, and attack there. We've seen that in this, the sunburst uh, solar winds attack uh, just this week, uh, an attack on homebrew. Uh, and so these kinds of attacks and, and how you secure everything along your supply chain uh, is something that's really being focused on and it's going to lead to a lot of discussions. Another technology is eBPF. So this is a uh, kind of an advanced uh, sort of Linux um, kernel feature, uh, but one that's getting a lot of attention. And, and the reason for that is again, as you have this kind of explosion of services that are maybe running on top of a Linux machine, uh, eBPF provides this kind of native entry point um, that's a natural extension for, you know, controlling networking and observability um, without, you know, layering in a whole bunch of other stuff outside of the kernel. Um, and so I think this is a technology that, you know, developers may uh, want to, to follow, but definitely operators and, and, and folks that are running systems are going to want to understand uh, as it becomes more popular. And then finally, I think this is kind of a general catch-all category, but I think it's one that's important. And this is like tooling and the experience for developers and operators. So uh, we're seeing a huge um, kind of influx in how do we give developers and operators a great experience and make it really easy to do their jobs. And so there's probably a dozen things I could talk about here. Um, you know, GitOps is one thing you hear a lot about, right? This is the, how do I get, uh, the code that we're writing into production, into Kubernetes, uh, into my cloud native technology as, as best as I can. And a lot of folks are seeing that, you know, maybe having an agent that's pulling that, those changes into the cluster is better than something that pushes it. Um, you know, that's kind of, again, more of a Kubernetes methodology that I want to state my desired state and have some agent uh, making that true, right? So that's how you can think of GitOps. Uh, of course, Artificial intelligence, machine learning. I mean, it's it's something we've we talk about a lot, um, but it's more and more being seen as like a key solution to a wide scope of challenges for businesses. And you know, it's really challenging to design and build and implement successfully at scale and production settings. Um, and so, tools around cloud native like Kubeflow um, are really bringing a lot of that tooling, um, you know, kind of to maturity in a way that you can bring all of that together. Um, and then DX or developer experience, again, this is something that we've seen a huge focus on. We're seeing consolidation in the DevOps tooling space. You know, there's less and less companies doing it. More companies are doing more. Um, and I think developers and operators are going to come to expect that all of these tools are just integrated into a single platform that allows kind of the dual goal of getting software built and shipped quickly, but also maintaining and operating that software uh, in the future together. So, okay, let's say those are the trends today. Um, you know, what's next? How can you, you possibly, possibly, uh, keep up with all this? And, and so that's a great question. <laughs> and so how could you possibly keep up with all these trends? Well, I think the, the, the clear answer is, well, you can't, <laughs> it's not possible. Right. And I don't think you should put pressure on yourselves, you know, um, to understand and, and have a grasp of all of these technology changes and, um, you know, know everything about them and dive a mile deep. I mean, they're going to come and go. Uh, and so that's hard. But I, I think you can try. Like, I think you can do a number of things to enable yourself to be adaptive uh, in our industry. Um, I think the, the number one way to do that is just to accept you're going to be in a constant state of learning and be okay with that. Like, that's how it works. I don't know very much. <laughs> and the more I learn, the less I, you know, know, or the more I know, I don't know. And, and that's okay. Right. Um, but there's a lot of great ways I think that you can enable yourself to be learning. Um, one, I, I'd highly uh, encourage you to attend KubeCon. And if you uh, are having an issue uh, uh, with, with making that happen, please, you know, find me on Twitter and let me know. I'd like to help. Um, 
I think you should follow folks. I think Twitter is a great place to follow folks that you're interested in, uh, topics you're interested in. Um, and then on the CNCF side, if you're not in the CNCF Slack, um, highly recommend joining that. There's lots of um, channels for different areas that you might be interested in. Um, and then also um, SIGs. So let's let's talk about that. So folks to follow. Um, I just put a couple here. Kelsey Hightower, if you're not following him, you have to follow him. I also would recommend following Priyanka. Priyanka Sharma is the, the general manager of the CNCF. She's speaking at this conference as well, uh, but she really helps highlight all the things that Team Cloud Native is doing. Uh, also take a look at the ambassador program from the CNCF. Um, it's a great program and there's a lot of great folks all across the world that you can follow from that. And then of course, shamelessly, I'll just plug that you should follow me at O'Leary Crew on Twitter. Um, but I also encourage you to, you know, take a look at what the special interest groups are doing. So these are called SIGs. And, you know, these groups focus on a very specific uh, topic and they, they create a lot of great information. Uh, so for instance, I talked about supply chain security. If that's something that you're interested in, uh, SIG Security right now is working on a huge paper on supply chain security. Um, and I've learned so much from just, just kind of from afar watching those folks uh, work on that paper. Uh, and then also, I think it's been mentioned, um, but there's also, you know, finally a, a mentoring program. If you're looking for a mentor, uh, there's a huge mentoring program uh, as a part of the CNCF, and I would really encourage you to check that out. Um, and that would be great. And it, it's even on GitHub and I work for GitLab, but that's how much I care about <laughs> the mentoring program. Um, you know, sign up for that. So thank you so much uh, again for having me today. It was really uh, my pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, again, if you've got questions, I'd love to take them now. Um, and uh, and if not, if you, if you want to follow up with me on Twitter afterwards, again, I'm very open. My DMs are wide open if you, if you have any questions after today. Awesome, awesome. Like, that was a wonderful presentation. Like, I really, really enjoyed um, the presentation. You know, I've, I don't think I've actually had the opportunity to learn you know, how the, the whole cloud uh, ecosystem came to be and you know, how basically what the future is for Kubernetes and cloud native technologies. I mean, this was a really, really insightful um, session. Thanks a lot for that, Brandon. And yeah, um, this is time for Q and A. Um, if you have any questions for Brandon, please feel free to drop it on the chat section. And if you're also streaming live on YouTube, feel free to as well drop some questions on the uh, live chat. Um, Brandon and I will be happy to answer your questions. Um, yeah, for the for the slides, uh, Brandon, I don't know if you can be able to access your slides. Yes, I just uh, dropped a link in the chat. Okay. Happy to happy to share those. Um, awesome. So yeah, take a take a look. It should be in the in the chat now. Yeah, yeah. Great. I just say now. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, please, uh, if you are watching this live, um, please feel free to. You know, tweets you know, on Twitter, shout some tweets, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, feel free to talk about the event using the hashtag KCT Africa and you know let people know about this event. I mean I, I think this has been awesome. I mean the quality of uh, content we've been able to absorb has been really, really amazing. So yeah, um, thanks once again Brandon and yeah, yeah happy to uh, to be able to uh, facilitate this session with you and i look forward to meeting you some other time yeah soon Hopefully yeah soon. and, and of, of of course and uh, i mean yeah still in the pandemic where, but yeah where where are you based out of um, i i missed that at the beginning oh I yeah so yeah i'm currently <laughs> based uh in Enugu, nigeria um I'm oh, okay great nigeria. yeah it's awesome yeah Eastern part of nigeria so yeah cool great. awesome yeah Thanks once again, Brendan. And yeah, we'll move to the next speaker then. Great. Thank you.